You are now unmuted. <clears throat> okay, hello, Helen. I see that there are a few other people in the etherpad, so I assume they will show up here soon. Sorry, just finding my unmute button. Hi. Hello. <laughs> How you doing? Yeah, good. Hello, Gustavo. Okay, so um, I'm going to switch to sharing my screen so that we can then face. Yes, you see my screen now and the etherpad. Okay. Yep, I can see. Good. Some more people showing up. Okay, so um, this session is improvised uh, even more than the others because I got the idea for the session only uh, yesterday night when attending the one on who gets to participate in open science projects. Um, and there are a number of things that came up there, I think, uh, were just not discussed for several reasons, mostly time and also uh, yeah, the, the structure of the session was very much focused on uh, this one project, Wella. And uh, here I want to zoom out a little bit into the broader open science landscape. But I'm glad that uh, Gustavo is here, who was part of the other session. And uh, so maybe we can uh, actually bridge the two sessions and uh, try to figure out some ways in which we can move these conversations forward. So. Um, I posted this session proposal essentially live during one of the sessions yesterday, so uh, the entire description and all of that was really very quickly done. And so I called it Platforms Facilitating Open Science. That was in response to one of the questions that was posed yesterday by the organizers of the session to everyone who was in attendance. And um, so we, we posted some uh, things into the chat there, but then we didn't get time to discuss it. Um, upon further thought, I also included language as a platform because that was another point that came up in that uh, conversation. And uh, so we have to understand the term platform here in a very broad sense. And uh, at the bottom of the etherpad, I tried to give the discussion for today a little bit of structure. So I've uh, we're in point one right now. We consider platforms in a very broad sense. Point two would be, uh, what are the language related aspects that kind of um, modulate participation in open science projects? And I have uh, come up with some very rough structure on how to go about doing this. And then uh, number three is what is probably closest to the classical understanding of the term platform here. Um, I gave essentially the same links that I gave uh, yesterday and uh, there is a brief uh, description for most of those and I'm happy to give a demo for each of those but I'm also um, happy to discuss any other platforms that anyone on this call might uh, want to discuss because they have particularly interesting features or something like this. And then I'm also happy to broaden the discussion even further to other kinds of platforms. So for instance, um, the, the term platform is also used in the context of vaccine development, for instance. And then um, vaccine development is traditionally a business that is done by big pharma, not very openly, but COVID has changed the play here a little bit. And so we could also talk about uh, openness of platforms like that. And I put a lot of question marks in there, which basically means I'm, I'm very open to you adjusting the structure. We could also um, basically have you meddle with this. The etherpad can be edited by anyone. And so if you see a way to um, change any of that, uh, that could guide the discussion today, then please go in. And, or if, you, if any of those points are particularly interesting for you, just uh, go there, leave a mark, then that can guide us, that can prioritize what we're doing in this session. We have one hour, I've already spoken five minutes, 
and uh, so um, I'll, I'll just dive in unless somebody um, kind of um, points me into another direction. So, um, and I don't see the uh, the chat. Can you unpick platforms, please? Unpick platforms. <laughs> Uh, ah, okay, so that is um, basically you want me to define platforms. I think I have done this to some extent. You, you that, did, you did actually. I said that before you asked. Thank you very much. Yeah, so if that's not enough, then always uh, come in. And it's better for you to leave comments in the Etherpad because you see the entire screen that I see, and the comments that you leave in a big blue button are more or less for the other attendees at the moment, not necessarily for me. Um, so let's start with language. Um, so I, I've given it some structure here. Lots of open science projects and also citizen science projects, uh, they're English only. Um, I'm actually uh, including citizen science in this particular conversation because for citizen science, language is actually a de determining factor. If you want to run a citizen science project and uh, the languages in which you offer a project don't fit the community you want to interact with, then it's not going to work. So. Um, it is an important factor. For open science, this is less of an issue because most scientists have some working knowledge of English and so they can deal with, uh, at least passively, with English. Um, but, but still, um, it's, it is a matter of concern. So, um, I think English-only projects, uh, it wouldn't take long for us to enumerate, so I'm actually going to ignore this because that's kind of the default here. Um, if you want to talk about those, please chime in. Then uh, there are also monolingual projects that are uh, in other languages, um, mostly like French, Spanish, German, and, and, and some other languages, um, like Japanese, Chinese, um, and so on. So uh, you could say like the ma major, some of the major languages uh, correlates well with the major economies, things like that. Um, again, these are um, monolingual, and uh, they, so the language kind of defines the community that uh, can interact with those projects. And while I think they're a bit more interesting than the English monolinguals, I will ignore those as well, unless you want me to go into them. Um, and now uh, it, we are get, getting into those projects where I think um, there is let's say, room for creativity on the part of the organizers of the project in order to take language into account. So um, it starts with the framing. Um, so lots of platforms actually have an arrangement where they uh, essentially present their um, project in an English plus X or X plus English kind of uh, fashion, by which I mean either English is clearly defined as the default and then the rest is more or less an add-on or English is just one of a set of languages that are on offer and already this uh, is a different framing here and uh, in open science projects I see this very rarely um, so it basically the monolingual kind of thing is, is the default um, and if there is a, another language it's usually the English plus X X is the add-on and uh, or if it's one of those other um, major monolingual ones uh, or major languages, then sometimes English is also the add-on. Um, but still, it doesn't really feel like an, a plurilingual. Also, it's not entirely clear that uh, like how do you then communicate? Suppose you read something in a notebook that was, uh, let's say, in French. You don't know French enough to say something, but you understand enough to note, for instance, that this particular method that they used that day was interesting or that they made a mistake somewhere. And then, so what do you do? Um, you uh, contact them, probably in the language that you're most comfortable with. Uh, or you try to be polite and do it in, in bad French or you try to use English or whatever. And uh, so there are no community guidelines for this. And maybe there can't even be. Um, but uh, if you've come across those situations, maybe you can comment on how you would handle that. Um, and then um, here are, um, so let, let's just, basically the, the main question then is, yeah, how, how does uh, communication work if you have more than one language? And then here 
uh, once we switch to a set of languages uh, where English is is not even a part of the setup, uh, it gets even more complex because then um, it's harder to find. Like as long as you have some bit of English on your website, a usual web search if, uh, by some scientific terms in English will basically index it in, in some fashion. It will be part of the results. may not be op optimally placed, but it will be somewhat part of the results. But uh, if your site is entirely in non-English uh, languages, then you're basically invisible to normal uh, search. And that is certainly a problem of discoverability. So we could then think about how can we index those websites in a useful fashion such that they can be found even when people only search in English that they know, oh, there is this website. It's in Chinese and French, um, but it is on the very topic I'm interested in. And then they can uh, maybe contact a collaborator that knows one of those languages in order to help them navigate that particular resource. Um, but also that is not very formalized, but uh, that's the kind of thing I would like to actually discuss here to explore what workflows we could think of in order to facilitate the discovery of resources um, that are in other languages, but otherwise relevant to the people who are searching for information. And then, of course, you have projects that are genuinely multilingual, and there you can set a cutoff at, I arbitrarily set it at 20 languages, um, which will exclude <laughs> like the large majority of projects. But uh, you can put the cutoff somewhere else, let's say four or eight or 10 or something like this, doesn't matter too much. Um, the reason why I distinguish them from the plurilingual ones is that um, the multilingual ones do not necessarily have a clear default language or um, the uh, communication across languages is just normal. So if you find something that is written in Mongolian and you want to comment on it in Portuguese, that's completely fine. And then the community will work out mechanisms by which these two languages uh, or the content that has been um, produced or provided or shared in the, those two languages can actually interact. There will always be some people who can, um, if not speak both of those languages, but then maybe translate that into some other lingua franca, like from Mongolian maybe to Chinese or Russian. And then from there we can get it into Portuguese. And, uh, but, but that is a community for which language is much more of a central thing than uh, those communities that we've had um, so, so far. There, typically the focus is on the content, like let's say the, the research topic. Um, and unless we're in linguistics or uh, some language related fields of study, this is typically not very focused on language. Um, but those multilingual projects, they just don't work if uh, language is an afterthought. So uh, the infrastructure, the communication channels, and even things like um, left to right and right to left languages or diacritics and things like that, all of this has to be baked into the, um, result, into the design of the web page. And um, yeah, so that, that was the first rundown of uh, questions or issues that I had in my mind uh, while we were discussing this yesterday and didn't have time to go deeper into this. And so I would like to stop here for a moment to ask whether anyone has um, any questions or, or comments on the, um, the projects or the, this, this kind of framing and or whether uh, in the projects that you're doing you have run into any of those issues that uh, would fit into this uh, brief taxonomy of projects by language and then how that uh, relates to open science or citizen science or related topics. So if you have thoughts on that, please put them forward. And I'll use the moment to see what people have uh, or are writing uh, at the bottom. Haha, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, question. Yeah, I'll let you finish the typing. Yeah, okay, retrofitting. Uh, there are lots of things here. Um, yes, so uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, anything in terms of the multilingual, of course, works in the Wikimedia ecosystem. I've spoken quite a bit about the Wikimedia ecosystem already. Um, 
and uh, so I, well, I can of course, I can of course go into more detail, um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm a bit distracted right now because people try to call me, and my son is not um, handling the telephone for me. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. So um, yeah, in the retrofitting can be done in in multiple factions. Um, and here actually open licensing is uh, something to keep in mind. So suppose there is a text that is in some language and then you want to transfer uh, the text into another language and then if the text is uh, copyrighted then uh, basically you, do, you would have to ask the copyright owner whether you're allowed to do that and that makes it all uh, complex. If, however, the text is openly licensed, let's say for simplicity, uh, licensed compatibly to Wikipedia, then uh, you're completely free to rewrite it in another language, uh, as long as the source is properly attributed. And um, this is something that often happens, for instance, with images that are being shared through open access literature. Uh, the open access literature is dominantly in English, um, and, but if there is a nice illustration for a particular concept in a scholarly article, then this illustration might end up in Wikimedia Commons. And then uh, people might actually translate this into multiple languages. And uh, so even though the figure was originally designed for an English language scholarly article, it might end up in uh, an Indonesian Wikipedia article or something like this. So that's one way of uh, interpreting the retrofitting here. Uh, there are other mechanisms, like, uh, for instance, you, um, we could talk about um, browsing the content or just browse the, the navigation of the site. Uh, you might well have multilingual content, uh, but the navigation is still monolingual or uh, just has a few languages. Um, and uh, that also sometimes creates um, interesting interactions. Um, on Wikimedia sites, uh, especially on Wikidata, you can essentially browse it. There's content in about 400 languages and then you can confidently browse it in maybe 200. Um, and uh, you can still say things about uh, languages that are not included in those 400. Um, so for instance, some languages that uh, are dead nowadays, you can still um, say things about them and you can use uh, like if you have some stone inscriptions somewhere from uh, like ancient Babylonians or something like this and you want to annotate that particular text it will contain certain concepts some of which will have identifiers in Wikidata and then you can annotate that stone tablet with uh, Wikidata context and uh, uh, Wikidata um, content identifiers and so you could then essentially read that tablet in whatever language you choose to browse Wikidata. Uh, so there are lo lots of mechanisms to do that. But still, in open science context, this, is, this would be rather rare. And uh, it's also, if you already have content and it is uh, designed for a particular language, then it is typically hard to adapt it uh, and make that, let's say, uh, legacy content easily available in other languages because you didn't really put it into a format where the uh, switching between languages is facilitated and things like that. Okay, well this was some rambling brain dump on line 62. Now let's see what happens in line 65. Some sciences often have enough non-language content they are useful to non-speakers. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I uh, studied a year in Japan and I found it very easy to study theoretical physics because you always had the equations to go along. And I also took some courses in anthropology where they had uh, a specialized character for essentially every concept. And while I knew a number of characters, there were so many characters I was often lost. And, and so even though in principle you might think, well, anthropology might be simpler than uh, theoretical physics, but for me it was the opposite. As like, at least when... Uh, like taking the course through Japanese. So yes, this resonates well with me. And also, yes, yeah, scientific language is so formalized that it's relatively easy to parse. This is even true in uh, languages like Korean, where you have uh, lots of the scientific terms that are taken from English. They are written in Korean, but as long as you recognize the alphabet, you basically know, oh, this is the English term, and then you can navigate that language. Um, 
And um, so, yeah, this it's useful to know the terms. But on the other hand, the reverse is also um, something to consider. Um, a native a speaker of the target language, let's say English, uh, might be completely lost when presented with a scientific article because there is so much jargon in there uh, where terms like energy and forces and a set or a unit, they all have a very specific meaning that uh, is um, very precise in that particular context but might not overlap very much with the meaning that is in the head of that person if they are not from that particular field. Uh, and so language, uh, there are lots of shades of language that are relevant here. And in Wikipedia, again, we try to write for an audience that has basically finished high school. And so uh, we orient ourselves uh, at that level, which would mean, uh, since in at least the so-called so developed countries, uh, most people have finished high school, um, we are reaching a large uh, swath of the population. On the other hand, there are quite a few countries where the majority of uh, the population has not finished high school and uh, that maps to certain languages and uh, so we will have to think about how to um, convey such scientific concepts in those languages. So, for instance, I'm um, exploring some of those questions with Swahili um, and where the majority of speakers uh, do not have a high school, kind of uh, haven't finished high school, and uh, but still uh, they want to learn about this and things like climate change or um, um, air pollution, all these kind of things, that's all relevant and so it needs to be presented to them. Or another example, during the Ebola crisis, um, there were lots of people affected in Western Africa mainly and uh, World Health Organizations and National Institutes of Health and many organizations were putting out very good information about the Ebola virus, but they forgot to put it out in the language of the people who were actually sick um, or who were treating them. And uh, so in the end, uh, it, it turned out to be Wikipedia was the most sought, um, let, let's say, source um, about the Ebola virus in the countries most affected because Wikipedia provided that content in the languages that the people actually speak who are, who are directly affected by that virus. And so um, here we, we really have to um, keep in mind that, well, why do we communicate information about the virus? To what extent do we want to contribute to uh, research about the virus as a biological system or to um, actually alleviating the situa situation of the people who actually have to deal with the virus right now, who are sick or whose uh, parents or children are sick with that, or who have to explain to their village that the burial practices have to be changed. All of this. Okay. Uh, so much to line 65. Now I'm jumping to line 67. There's a big difference between written language and spoken language. Oh, yes. Um, and um, yeah, most of those platforms, they use text to um, convey information. But right now, I am speaking to you and I'm speaking with my non-native way of talking English um, and people who are not used to either English or specifically my way of using English, uh, they might have a harder time um, perceiving or, or making sense of that information when it's given as an audio stream as we do it right now and they might have a, an easier time if uh, they could just read what I'm saying, yes. Um, so these issues also have to be considered um, when we're talking about the design of platforms or interaction mechanisms, communication channels. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'll jump to line 69. What you're talking about is super relevant. There is also a difference between lay language and scientific... Okay, yes, uh, I mentioned that already. Um, some other things that people put up here is GitHub, GitLab, online versus offline in-person projects. Uh, yeah, so the GitHub GitLab is uh, something I would like to discuss in the context of these other platforms. And here with this online versus offline, I don't really know what you have in mind. Uh, and so instead of me just babbling uh, away on this topic, I would request that you add some more information here under line 60. Uh, or that you just open the microphone and, and talk for yourself. Otherwise, I would uh, now basically turn to the technical platforms and then briefly demo some of them and then we can discuss to what extent 
they actually are inviting um, to um, whoever is interested in participating. Um, yeah, so I'll wait for a little moment and then um, that, that's the plan. We would then go on with those technical platforms. Yeah, I'm typing here a note for something that I'm still um, wanting to add. Yeah. Um, since we're just talking about this, I'm looking for a particular um, yeah. So usability is uh, something that I have uh, for instance, proposed as a session at the European Citizen Science Association meeting twice, <laughs> and it twice didn't make it. It didn't make it into the uh, conference schedule. Um, but uh, for for citizen science project, I've actually done a number of experiments. So we had a little uh, hackathon where. A number of us sat down for an hour or so, and we try. Uh, we had a list of citizen science projects, and we were all competent in citizen science projects. And we said, "Okay, let's try to engage. Let's try to find a mechanism to contribute to some of those uh, citizen science projects on that list while we are here and uh, help each other out if we get stuck." In the end, we did not contribute any single data point or anything to those because. Uh, those projects made it actually very hard to participate, even for people who were willing and competent um, to, um, to contribute. Uh, and that is something that, um, yeah, also needs to be kept in mind. But I don't want to focus on that too much right now. It's just a, a thought that uh, crossed my mind while I was uh, reading through your thoughts. And now I see that uh, more content has been added here. So let's briefly review. What's there? Line 61. What happens when multilingual interaction happens in person or online or both? Okay. Um, well, it depends. <laughs> um, multilingual interaction between people who actually uh, are fluent in multiple languages uh, might be a lot of fun. And um, sometimes you, actually, you just switch to another language where you have uh, a better means to actually convey that particular message that you want to convey but the problem is this easily breaks down if you have a group of more than two or three because the language pairs or language combinations that those people uh, around you might know are, are just different than what what you have and so uh, it, at, the larger the group gets the smaller the choice of languages uh, to communicate uh, in the group uh, so that's one thing to really keep in mind which is also why for this event where uh, the choice of language was left open for everyone. Essentially, everyone converged onto English, even though for the majority of participants, English is not the native language. Um, and so that's just the nature of the beast. And the question then is, should we uh, consciously do something against that? Um, so, for instance, in France, they have certain regulations where they say, oh, uh, a certain percentage of the music that is being played on the radio has to be French music and so on. We could think of similar kinds of regulations, but the question is, does that move us forward in terms of um, um, promoting open science? Does that move us forward in terms of uh, improving research or improving uh, humanity's um, capability to address the biggest issue? And I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it really depends on uh, the mechanism by which we bring language into the picture. And then um, the question between online versus offline. Um, here, I personally don't see much of a difference uh, for people who are used to uh, do things online. Um, I assume that everybody's used to do things offline. Um, but for those people who are not used to do things online, uh, then having to do it in another language uh, is just another uh, layer of burden. And so it's, an, it's a participation barrier. But once you're used to it, um, like even my uh, younger son, he doesn't speak much English, but he is very uh, good at navigating websites that are in English. Um, because, yeah, he knows what a button looks like and what a button might be doing and things like that. Um, 
so yeah but sometimes you also press his buttons that it would be better if he hadn't pressed them <laughs> um okay so um i'll just have another look at this github thing and then we can move into the technical platforms here git based platforms yeah, da, 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 but they don't easily support multi-language projects well they support multi-language in the sense of programming languages or query languages like computer languages essentially but yes um, in terms of the human languages or the language of the contributors it's really hard to um, to coordinate that and uh, essentially everybody defaults to English or to one of those major languages and if you are uncomfortable with that kind of default setting for the project then even if you know the programming language it's it's kind of hard to get involved uh, and contribute in a meaningful fashion or uh, even if you get feedback on your let's say your pull request your suggestion on how to improve things then maybe you, you can't really make sense of the feedback because it's in the wrong language for you it is a problem but technically github gitlab they can be configured to run in essentially any language and there are quite a few uh, projects that actually do have um, reasonable support for at least um, several languages so they would fall into the plurilingual project uh, the truly multilingual ones there is not many of those um, and yeah, the ones that I'm most familiar with are Wikimedia projects and uh, OpenStreetMap and things like that okay so I suggest that now we're halfway into this se uh, session um, then uh, we switch to these technical platforms and uh, I'll briefly just demo them and uh, basically explain their relationship to open science and then we can discuss some further aspects. Um, okay, uh, support multi-language projects. Yeah, I'll dig those things out. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of some of them. Uh, I would expect certain Python libraries, for instance, uh, that they have uh, reasonable documentation in multiple languages. Uh, but I don't have a good example off the top of my head. Okay, so uh, let's jump here into, uh, let's just reorganize the buttons a little bit so that we don't close the wrong ones. So ask open science. Uh, so a little bit about this one. This was originally started on Stack Overflow but Stack Overflow has a um, kind of a policy that if you want to start a new site, you have to have a better feature. And this better feature cannot be public. But for an open science website, not to be public just didn't make any sense. And so there was not a lot of traffic during that period, but they used the traffic during that test period as a criterion to decide whether they will accept this new site or not. In the end, we uh, failed in terms of those traffic stats. And so they said, no, we don't want this open science thing because apparently nobody's interested in it. And so we took that content and uh, put it on to a, an open source version of um, a question and answer site and um, then enriched it and uh, kept it open. So this is now supported by a German university. And you can essentially, the idea is if you have a question about open science, um, you can put it here and if you uh, search for answers uh, to such questions that you might have you can search here many people do this in random locations like on Twitter on Instagram or in emails or whatever and that makes it very hard for the community as a whole to learn from uh, those conversations and which is why uh, Stack Overflow is so useful for let's say discussing programming related uh, issues especially bug reports and things like that um, but uh, here we have a similar mechanism, uh, similar tool, and um, it, it doesn't get a lot of um, traffic, but here you see they have a few thousand or a few hundred views each of those questions. So it's not, it's not zero either. Um, so, uh, and then otherwise it, it just works as you would expect for a question and answer uh, site. So I can add, ask new questions, I can rearrange the questions in a number of fashions, there's tagging and so on. Uh, so I, I assume you know this, but I would just like to encourage you to um, think of questions that uh, you think are useful, not just for you, but also for somebody else. And then you just post them here, as long as they have some relationship to open science. And this doesn't have to be science in the sense of natural science, but anything related to research. If it's like theoretical 
uh, religious studies, that's completely fine. <laughs> um, and um, or ancient Greek history, whatever. This is fully within scope. And also, if you want to use open science or open materials in education, this is within scope. Um, so just think about this as one resource. And uh, if you have a question on a particular topic, chances are that somebody else had that question already. And if you're lucky, you've already found a conversation about this on this website. Um, Jogel, I actually don't know how to pronounce this. So this is an abbreviation of just one giant lab. The basic idea is if we're doing open science, then essentially um, we are all in one big lab or uh, research group or, or something like this. And um, this means that uh, all that we need to do is actually coordinate who is doing what and tell each other uh, like, what do you plan to do? What skills you need for that? What skills you already have, and what skills you're uh, like you're missing? Or and so you can then use this platform to find people who have the skills that uh, you are missing in your project. And uh, this works essentially like a dating site for uh, research projects. Um, yeah, um, we can briefly have a look at some of those. They have uh, themed. Features, they also, uh, it loads very slowly now, demo effect. <laughs> yeah, um, they have discussion features. Uh, yeah, of course they're doing something about COVID, everybody's doing this, but here they uh, make a point of essentially making everything in the open. Many other COVID um, initiatives, they have some open component, but still they have uh, key components that are not open. And here, essentially everything here is open. And so you can contribute uh, yeah, they have challenges uh, here. That's the needs that I was talking about. Um, so uh, individual participants, they can, so here they are looking for a data scientist, for a research assistant, uh, primer validation, things like that, right? So um, if you have any competences uh, that are uh, sought after, then that's a very easy uh, mechanism to get involved. and. Uh, if you have an idea and uh, you need some assistance in actually putting it into practice, then here you can uh, just post the idea and then ask uh, for others to join in and things like that. So um, that's about it, Jogel. Now we move on to Rio. So this is a journal, a scholarly journal. It's called Research Ideas and Outcomes. And so like any other journal, it has articles and um, the importance here is that it does not just have research articles, but here, for instance, you have uh, a, a grant proposal. Um, here's another grant proposal, yet another grant proposal, uh, research article, and so on, research idea. So uh, there's an entire ecosystem of things that you wouldn't normally publish in a scholarly literature. Um, so my favorites here are actually data management plans. Yeah, so in... Um, most contexts, data management plans are kept secret, but here in this journal, you can actually publish them. And uh, then that, it's just another article. The idea behind this journal is to actually make visible the intermediate steps of the research cycle. Um, and that can start with a research idea. So let me also briefly demo that. So um, research idea, yeah, here, for instance, research ideas. Um, and then once you have the idea, you can, yeah, you can basically publish it, which means that if someone else has that idea or um, has a similar idea, they can find you, they can contact you, and then you can collaborate. Or they can crit criticize your approach and say, oh, look, what you plan to do here is maybe not optimal. Look, uh, maybe consider this or that variant of your um, methodology. Um, yeah, and also um, in terms of grant proposals, so um, we have proposals from a number of uh, funders. Um, and then most grant proposals, uh, they get viewed by the number of people who write them and then a, a few people who uh, review them. Um, but if we just look at, if we sort those grant proposals by the number of views that they have received here, uh, you see that this goes into the thousands, so 33,000 grant proposals. This is one of the most viewed grant proposals on the web. Um, 
And this is just the idea. Once we expose those intermediate steps of the research cycle, then it uh, opens up so many opportunities for people to engage. And so if you share your, um, the early parts of your research cycle, then this means that uh, you open up the project for participation much more widely than most uh, of the traditional uh, research projects, which only talk about this in public once the research is actually finished, when, once they have one of the classical research outcomes, that is a research article that actually pr uh, presents some results. Here, you already start with your uh, grant proposal and the data management plan, which is uh, an outline of what you plan to do. And if this is public, then the public can engage with that and they can then co design your project, contribute in various fashions, and help uh, disseminate it, reach out to other communities that might be affected, that might benefit from the research that you do. Okay, then here, Open Science Framework. Yeah, and by the way, uh, still feel free to interrupt me by just putting stuff into the etherpad. I will just briefly go through this um, set of websites here. <laughs> Actually, I'm not signed in right now. Um, but uh, Open Science Framework is a uh, platform that allows you to share files um, that you use in your day-to-day -day work. And so here you see uh, a number of uh, sites with which they are integrated. So you can use uh, ORCID for login. You can integrate your Open Science Framework um, materials with Zotero or Mendeley for um, reference management. You can use things like Dropbox or Google Drive to also store files. And um, there should be, yeah, we can also search. And then let's just say, hello. So, uh, whatever. Um, yeah, so here there's a project, water pollution, water conservation. Uh, right, and then uh, each project has a landing page, and then um, you can actually keep thing, some of the things uh, private. Um, some people prefer that, uh, especially while the project is still ongoing. But the nice thing about this is, while you keep it private, um, you essentially have a publish button. So at the moment when you decide to make things public, it's just pressing this one button, and then it's all public. Um, which is a different mindset than um, what typically happens after you publish your research. You write your article and then somebody says, yeah, what, what about the data or what about uh, like the documentation of what you've actually done? Um, and then they say, oh, I don't have the time to document all of this. Open Science Framework provides you with a mechanism by which you can actually document those things as you go while the project is ongoing. So it m might well be untidy in, in, in between at some point. Um, but once uh, you finish your project, um, then it makes it really easy to, uh, to publish this and make this available. But many people, many projects actually choose to make uh, the materials available uh, as the project is uh, going on. And uh, then you can browse the files or uh, engage with, uh, with them in uh, a number of ways. And uh, yeah, they... Uh, if you are running a project on Open Science Framework, they provide you with a number of mechanisms to integrate this with other elements of your workflows. Um, the major limitation is this: uh, this comes out of like uh, psychology, and uh, so things that are heavy in computation, they are not really part of the main uh, use case. But if you are doing uh, Open Science at a small scale, like uh, individual lab notebooks and a small number of collaborators, things that would fit onto your laptop on an, or onto your hard drive, that's the kind of thing that would easily fit onto Open Science Framework. Um, now, the last thing I would just uh, like to mention is Wikimedia projects. So, um, they, I, I mentioned them in Open Science contexts for uh, a number of reasons because they show the collaborative workflows that I would like to see in science more often. They're all openly licensed. They are um, covering research materials, research methods, and all these kind of things. And they're being used in research. So for instance, Wikipedia is one of the largest um, text corpuses or corpora on the web. And uh, so 
anybody basically working in a natural language processing and uh, they, they are using Wikipedia as a training data set. And uh, so uh, not just to train their machines, but also actually to train the students to train machines and to learn about machine learning and data science or computational linguistics and so on. And uh, likewise, uh, wiki species is used in uh, biodiversity contexts. Wikidata is used in enormous uh, amount of uh, contexts, especially cultural heritage, but also more and more natural sciences, genetics, and, and so on. And uh, Wikisource, of course, is important in the historical sciences. And so all of these platforms, they form an ecosystem that I briefly described in the session on Monday. Um, and that ecosystem interacts with open science in many different fashions. And the, uh, uh, it is largely organized by information channel. So Wikipedia is the encyclopedia, Wiktionary is the dictionary, Wikiquote is the collection of quotes, and so on. Um, but it's also organized by language. And uh, there are interesting differences between some of those sites. So for instance, Wikipedia, um, there are uh, about 300 different Wikipedias, and the difference is expressed in terms of the language in which that particular Wikipedia is run. So each individual Wikipedia is a mono monolingual thing, but as a set, they are multilingual. On the other hand, um, um, some of those websites like Wikidata and Wikimedia Commons, they're essentially, it's one website but you can contribute in any of those 400 or so languages. And this, this changes the dynamics uh, quite a bit. Um, and then you, yeah, you also have mechanisms like the MetaWiki, which is used to talk about anything relevant to any of those projects. And there, yes, English emerges as the default um, language because that's just the nature of the internet. Um, but yeah, um, there are solutions to many of the problems that we would face if we were to implement open science or citizen science projects in a multilingual fashion. And those solutions are often already in place in the Wikimedia ecosystem. Yeah, um, one thing that I actually wanted to put in here is Wikijournal. I'm not sure who put it in, but thanks. So um, one of the mechanisms by which uh, Wikimedia, um, haha, <laughs> okay. Um, by which Wikimedia interacts with, um, with uh, open science is Wikijournal. So yeah. let's try to use this one. So that is essentially a scholarly journal that is implemented on Wikiversity. Wikiversity is one of those um, different, let's call it information channels in the Wiki ecosystem. And here, so this is a journal. It uh, has, publishes issues. You can see, um, yeah, most recent publication. It, it issues DOIs for its content. Um, so let's look at that one. And then it, it publishes, it practices open peer review. So uh, somewhere there is um, a link to the review. So here's the reviewer comments uh, and so on. So it's basically doing open access journal, it, it, it does public peer review, and uh, then it is uh, available in a format that allows reuse in Wikipedia, or some of those are actually articles that have initially been written for Wikipedia, and then uh, they have been subjected to peer review by actual experts. Um, whereas in Wikipedia, anyone can contrib contribute, uh, you don't need to be an expert, but here for the peer review, uh, they're using the normal peer review, so someone with actual expertise in the matter is going to review these articles. Uh, and there are a number of other initiatives that have a similar focus. So for instance, at uh, the publisher PLOS, Public Library of Science, they have an uh, article track that's called the Topic Pages, where the um, article designed for the journal is first uh, written in on a wiki and then can easily be uh, imported into the English Wikipedia. So once the article is published on in the journal, it goes also live on the English Wikipedia, where it can then be updated and uh, further improved or, or contextualized or even translated much more easily than in the journal context. Um, yeah, so that's... And Wikijournal, there is an, uh, a whole family of Wikijournals. I've just demoed the Wikijournal of Medicine. There is one for humanities and sciences, and uh, there is an ecosystem around that. Um, yeah, then... Here I already briefly spoke about this. So 
EXA is the European Citizen Science Association. They have a uh, biannual meeting essentially. And here I had a session proposal in 2016 and 2018 about usability of um, citizen science projects, uh, which I think is an issue. Um, uh, but usability goes way beyond just the language issues that we've discussed so far. Now I see that you've written down some more things. I will use those. But uh, while I read, I will not speak for a while. And you can use that uh, to um, unmute yourself and maybe talk uh, for a moment as well. Oh, have you ever seen open science go wrong? Uh -huh, okay. Uh, let me think about this a little bit and I'm reading the rest. Oh yeah, uh, open sites automatically get bought by mega publishers. Here it's really important uh, to have some sort of um, an open governance model, for instance, a clause in your bylaws that prohibits that you're being bought out. Um, so yes, I have contributed to a number of projects that initially declared themselves open, but at some point they were just bought by someone who then uh, made them less open. They, um, they chose which aspects uh, could remain open and the rest was made closed because that it was part of the business model. Um, but by now, the open community has learned from a number of those uh, occasions. So we have mechanisms to, um, to avoid that. It's just that those mechanisms are not widely enough known in the community. And so we keep repeating those mistakes. What's your experience with automatic translations? Uh, yeah, actually, it's getting much better because uh, deep learning is um, entering this field of translation and has made tremendous progress over the last five-ish years. Um, but still, for someone who is reasonably fluent in both languages, um, the uh, a translation made by a machine is usually uh, relatively easy to spot uh, because the machine just makes mistakes that a normal translator wouldn't. And uh, so probably it's still a few years uh, into the future that automatic translations will be good enough for most purposes. They're already good enough for some purposes, um, but especially in scientific contexts where you need to have very precise language, they often fail. Also for, an, uh, for a reason that is, um, let's say, external to the machine, uh, that is, some terms just don't exist in the other languages. Um, and because science is often expressed in a limited set of languages and so some of the concepts for which scientific language has a word or a term they just don't uh, translate easily to other languages and now i see that the etherpad has gone away and was reloaded i don't know what happened <laughs> i didn't do that but i'm glad that we're back okay so uh here have you ever seen open science go wrong um I'm sure I have. It's just that um, I can't think of a good example right now. Uh, but that's certainly one to, to follow up on. Um, so what could go wrong? Maybe let's, let's just briefly elaborate on those things. What could go wrong? You could be scooped, right? Uh, someone could take uh, the stuff that you put out into the open uh, and they could uh, republish it and or package it such that it appears to the world that they are the originator of that particular method or insight or set of data or code or whatever and yeah this certainly has happened and uh, then some of those people they would pretend oh it was their idea and it uh, even though they might have stolen from you or but sometimes it's really hard for for you to tell whether they actually got it from uh, from you or whether they uh, thought of this uh, themselves um, what else could go wrong? Um, open science projects have gone wrong in a number of, uh, let's say, engagement dimensions. Uh, so we've had lots of websites being set up uh, with high hopes and actually often high quality content, but then community contributions didn't uh, come in as much as expected uh, because researchers often underestimate the effort that is involved in actually building a community if you want to do crowdsourcing or citizen, citizen science projects or something like this. So, uh, yes, a number of projects have failed on that end. Lots of projects have failed 
in terms of long-term infrastructure uh, availability or funding. So, uh, for, for instance, Open Wetware um, is a website that you can use to share your research notebooks or your lab notebooks. And that had some decent funding around 2009-ish. Uh, and uh, then the, the website is still up, but it has a lot of technical debt because in the years in between, there was not a lot of resources available uh, to actually keep the software updated and fix security problems and things like that and modernize it a little bit because the world around it uh, was moving forward. And um, so those problems, they affect lots of open science projects, which is another reason why integration of such activities into more stably funded uh, platforms like the Wikimedia platforms makes a lot of sense. Um, so if you integrate your data set or database into Wikidata, um, you have a funding model that is driven by usability, usefulness of the platform. So essentially, as long as Wikipedia and Wikidata remain useful to the world, people will donate to them. And uh, that is a, a rather stable uh, model and it's self-reinforcing. Uh, as it, uh, compared to the usual funding cycles in research, especially research infrastructure. Almost no funder is funding research infrastructure. And if so, they uh, often do it in a heavy-handed fashion that doesn't leave a lot of room for actual community involvement. And uh, so um, building on op existing open infrastructure, like the open uh, the Wikimedia projects or so, is actually a very promising mechanism. And plus, you, you already have a community there. Uh, you have community of people who care about earthquakes or about certain kinds of frogs, and they do this in multiple languages, and it's all open, uh, and uh, so uh, lots of opportunities to participate. Now we have like two minutes left, and I will... Uh, I haven't spoken about GitHub yet. <laughs> uh, I will briefly check whether there's anything... Oh yeah, many projects run out of energy, yes, uh, because open science for most people uh, is still like a volunteer and spare time activity. And uh, so they have other things to, um, to deal with as well. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, they're, they're human beings, they might want to have some sort of a private uh, life as well and maybe do some exercise in between. Um, and yeah, so sustaining those project is not an easy uh, issue. But here, the open science projects are not much different from many other volunteer-driven projects, like open source software or something like this. Many of those um, projects suffer similar problems. And so here, the open community uh, as a whole uh, would have to think about mechanisms to do that. And there, I'm, I'm kind of glad to see that there is a little drive by certain funders to give more attention to um, sustaining open infrastructure. It's not yet uh, like a huge amount of support that comes, but at least the consciousness of that being a problem has risen and has reached some of the funders. Um, we'll see how this will affect the ecosystem. Okay, yeah, so just a brief word on GitHub and GitLab. So if you're involved in software development, then Git is a, an essential mechanism for version control, which is useful for any research project, open or not, but GitHub and GitLab, they, uh, they are two, let's call it platforms, uh, who allow you to share your code in a very easy fashion that facilitates large-scale collaboration. And so, yes, um, that, that is also a platform that is worth uh, considering, and it is already uh, part of many open uh, research workflows. Um, but even though this was developed for um, code versioning, I would just like to stress it is useful for anyone. So if you're just trying to keep track of history documents or whatever, and you're doing pure humanities or pure uh, medical uh, stuff, version control is very important. That, and that facilitates reproducibility and all of these other things that um, Open Science tries to address. And now we've reached the hour. I thank you for having been here. And I would like to still invite you to have uh, some, some final words here, if anyone is in the mood. Okay, otherwise I'll just end the recording and hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions. And I'm certainly happy to discuss any further thoughts that you might have on the matter of 
open science and platforms and how we can facilitate um, such interactions. Thank you. Thank you.